Why is this broke fool with a low education here? Upon exiting a high-end restaurant with my elementary school-aged son, we bumped into a classmate from my school days who used to dislike me. My son, realizing she worked at a bank, said, Hey, Dad, that lady was at the bank we went to last time. I remember her clearly. Let's close our $50 million account. What? My name is Michael. I'm currently 33 years old, with a son as my only family member, as my wife has already passed away. My son, who once toddled around, has grown up quickly and is now 12 years old. I may be called a doting parent for saying this, but despite not having a mother and the loneliness that must have ensued, he has grown into a bright and straightforward child. I am incredibly proud of my son. I met my late wife at a small factory where I started working after graduating from middle school. She was working as an office clerk there, also a middle school graduate and the same age as me. We were the only ones of our age there, surrounded by craftsmen who were mostly reticent. It was natural for us to become close friends quickly in such an environment. In January, a few years later, as soon as we both turned 18, we went to submit our marriage registration, officially becoming husband and wife. A year later, our son Alex was born. Despite working from an early age, our salaries weren't substantial due to our limited educational background. We didn't have much savings at that time, but I believe it was the happiest time for us as a family. A week before Alex's second birthday. Since Alex's birthday is coming up soon, I need to really put some effort into decorating the room. I have various preparations to make, so I'm going to do some chopping. Please look after Alex while I'm gone. She left in high spirits. An hour later, my phone rang, and thinking it was my wife, I checked the screen only to see an unknown number. Wondering if it might be a wrong number, I answered anyway, only to be informed that my wife had been killed by a drunk driver. Following that were days filled with visits to the police, funeral arrangements, and taking over the child care that my wife had mostly handled. To be honest, I was too busy to even cry, and I hardly remember anything from that time. A few days after saying goodbye to my wife, Alex started looking for her. Mommy, Mommy. He was too young to understand that she had passed away. Alex thoroughly searched the house, opening doors and the bathroom door multiple times, but of course, my wife was nowhere to be found. This continued for a while, and though it was a tough and sad time, I made sure to give Alex all the love from both parents. This strengthened our bond immensely. I had chosen not to pursue high school due to certain circumstances and instead had left home to work at a factory with a boarding house. Any place I could sleep was good enough for me. The factory I ended up working for was surprisingly ethical and didn't make me work long hours because I was a minor. Still yearning to learn, I often visited a library which was a five-minute walk from the boarding house. Meeting Joseph, who worked as a librarian there, was one of my lucky breaks. Now retired, Joseph was a former high school teacher. Seeing me reading old high school textbooks, he initially gave me specific advice on which books were easy to understand and even taught me how to study. I first met Joseph around late April. Impressed by my consistent studying at the dorm and continuous visits to the library, he started teaching me more advanced and diverse subjects. By the time I was 18, he suggested I take the GED. Michael, considering your learning ability and motivation, it would be a waste not to. You should definitely take the GED. Growing up, I always struggled with money, which was a big complex for me. However, that also sparked my interest in money circulation and economic systems. Joseph was a polymath with various interests, so he didn't just teach me academic subjects but also shared valuable knowledge about the world situation and economics. Last time I suggested the GED, but if you have the desire to study in a specialized field, you should definitely go to college. He said this, 
giving me another push forward. By that time, I had been dating my wife for a few years and was considering leaving the dorm to start a family. The idea of college suggested by Joseph was nothing but a distant dream at that point, but life was long and I thought maybe someday, if we had more financial stability. After Alex was born, I increased my overtime hours to provide for my family. After my wife passed away, I was swamped with work, household chores, and childcare, leaving almost no time for studying. I've lost count of how many times I've wished there were more than 24 hours in a day, or that there was another me. One morning, as I was about to drop Alex off at daycare and head to work, my legs wouldn't move as I intended, and before I knew it, I found myself sitting on a bench in front of a library. What am I doing? I need to get to work. Just then, someone called out to me from behind. Michael, what are you doing here so early in the morning? Turning around, I saw Joseph standing there with a kind face. Joseph knows everything and always teaches me new things. He gives me precise advice when I have problems, makes me laugh sometimes, and is a mentor in my life. Perhaps it was Joseph's calming presence that loosened the tension I had been holding, as I found myself shedding tears while recounting my life up until now. Joseph was calm. He listened carefully to each part of my story, nodding along. I talked about living with parents who were both addicted to alcohol and never ceased to be violent. How I was always injured in some way and constantly hungry. My indifferent parents never did laundry. We were cut off from gas, so we couldn't bathe, and I was always dirty, which made me the target of ridicule for my classmates. Even the teachers laughed at me and never treated me as a student. By the time I entered middle school, I was forced to work part-time jobs by lying about my age, and the money I worked hard to earn was all taken by my parents. On the night of my graduation, after my parents had passed out drunk, I fled with the bags I had secretly prepared and hidden. I had been living this life for over 10 years, but I was sick of it, so I ran away from home, met someone important, got married, had a lovely child, and finally, Finally, I thought I had a normal life and happiness. Why don't I have the things others take for granted? Why is it always me? Listening silently to my lament, Joseph hugged me tightly. Don't say that. You've done well so far. You're a father who can stand tall in front of your son. I respect you as a person, Michael. Hearing those words made me cry even harder. After a while, when I had calmed down, Joseph apologized to me. As a former teacher, that story is hard to hear. I'm sorry on behalf of those teachers who couldn't guide your future. I really am sorry. And there's something I've been hesitant to say, thinking it might be overstepping, but would you listen? Having cried out my past sorrows, I responded with determination to Joseph's suggestion, recognizing him as a reliable adult. I'll do it. That's good to hear. Seeing my reaction, Joseph smiled with relief. Today, Alex and I had come to our favorite restaurant. Feeling full and happy, I suddenly remembered the past. So much has happened, but it's already been 10 years. Alex has grown so much. Lost in these deep thoughts, Alex, who had come out of the restaurant with me, looked up at me with his innocent childlike face. What's wrong, Dad? Well, I was just thinking how much you've grown. You even had the horseradish with your roast beef today. It took me until I was an adult to start eating it. When I was a kid, I couldn't easily have beef so I didn't have a chance. I was 15 when I got my first paycheck and bought a pack of supermarket roast beef. I got carried away and put too much radish on it. And it shocked me right to the back of my head. I couldn't eat horseradish for a while after that, but I overcame it eventually. As I shared my memory with a teasing tone, my son, eager to seem grown up, said, Huh, I see, but I'm an adult now too. I won't say no to horseradish anymore. It makes beef so much tastier. Today's roast was the best. His cheeky words made me burst out laughing. There are many precocious kids these days, but I try to make sure Alex has a childhood as much as possible. However, 
with the increasing situations where he's becoming more discerning, I can't help but give her a smile and say, so it was significantly tastier, huh, that's great. But remember, moderation with spicy stuff while you're still in your teens. As we began walking home, a shrill voice called out from behind. Uh, what is there a dirty fool here? We came to enjoy some delicious food and this just ruins the mood. Surprised, I turned to see a woman looking at us with a frown. Her face and voice seemed vaguely familiar, but I couldn't place her. As I furrowed my brows, the woman pointed at me and loudly explained to her colleagues. That man was a dropout from my middle school, too poor to even go to high school, and not the brightest either. He never bathed, so he reeked, and his clothes were always ragged and dirty, repelling everyone. What's he doing in front of such a fancy restaurant? Did he go into debt to eat here? As I listened to her, I began to remember. Her name was Emily, a classmate from elementary to middle school. The first half of my school days was miserable due to my broken family environment, but what made it even worse was the relentless exclusion by classmates for being different. Emily, in particular, was the leader among the girls a prodigy with elite parents working at a city bank, excellent looks and grades, but also the one who disliked me the most. I never wanted to remember her, but here I am, forced to recall those memories, which is upsetting. While elementary students mostly just listen to their parents, middle schoolers start to form their own opinions, which can be troublesome. Whenever something went missing, she would say, my eraser is gone there's a thief among the poor, or if the floor was dirty, hey, it's dirty here, some filthy person is making the class dirty, directly blaming me, with classmates joining in the teasing, using the power of the group to ostracize me. Of course, I've decided never to engage in criminal activities, except for the part-time jobs I was forced to do by lying about my age during middle school, I've lived my life straight without distraction. The flood of unpleasant memories threatened to drag me back into my gloomy school days, but the warmth of the hand I was holding brought me back to reality. That's right, I have Alex. I'm not alone anymore. I need to pull myself together. Hey dad, that old lady has been looking over here and talking. Is she calling you a dropout? The woman, not missing Alex's words, shifted her target to my son. What? Did you just call me old lady? I'm still a mess, you know. And to think, genetics are so cruel and terrifying. If the parent is a dropout fool, the child turns out to be a fool too. I can tell. You look utterly empty-headed. And such a plain face too. Poor thing, looking just like your dad. You've really lost the parent lottery, haven't you? She exchanged looks and laughed mockingly with the women around her. I don't care what they say about me. I find it bothersome to engage with them, so let them mock me all they want. But when they insulted my precious child, not just me, I couldn't ignore it any longer. I'm sorry, Alex, for making you worry, and it's rude to call someone you don't know an old lady. That woman has always been a bit strange. Listening to her, it's like she's stuck in middle school. Haven't I always told you what's inside matters most? She's just disappointing on the inside. After stating this clearly to my son, the woman immediately became furious and started yelling in a hysterical voice. What did you say? That's outrageous. Poor, ugly, filthy, dropout fool daring to act all high and mighty. Hearing her voice, Alex was taken aback and made a well face before he seemed to realize something, looking up at me with a serious suggestion. Oh, wait, hey, dad, that old, oh, I misspoke. That woman was at the bank we went to the other day. I remember her because of the mall on her cheek, the color of her nails, and her voice, and this strong perfume smell. It's scary to think there's a crazy person at the bank. What if they misuse our money? Dead. We just deposited it. But let's move our $50 million to another bank. What? $50 million? After Emily's loud exclamation, a man hurried over to them. Sorry, everyone. The branch manager held me up. I'm late. Nathan can talk forever, you know. Let's go inside. 
It's time for our reservation. Facing each other, Emily's group and my son and I. The man, noticing the awkward atmosphere, quickly glanced between both parties and then smiled happily at Alex. Ah, I know you, you're Alex. I watch how Alex increases his money every time. I'm grateful to you. It's easy for kids to understand. So my son watches it with me. Since he started watching your videos, he's been seriously saving money instead of wasting it. Last month, he saved over $500 and bought me and my wife bouquets. I was so touched, I cried secretly. Thanks to you, Alex. Grateful words from the man made Alex smile too. Really? You watch my videos. Thanks. I'm uploading a new one about stocks at 7.30 tonight, so be sure to watch it. Alex confidently promoted his upcoming video, and I watched their interaction with a smile. I never thought we'd meet a viewer on the street. Glad to hear such a lovely story, but then Emily interrupted. What's this about? Money increasing in stocks, what's all this? The man began to explain with a surprised look. Wait, you don't know, he's really popular right now. Alex here is a prodigious child who, even before starting elementary school, had nearly finished reading all the renowned economics books. I thought if a child could understand it, then so could I. So I bought and tried reading some of the economics books Alex recommended, but they were completely beyond me, which just made me reconfirmed Alex's brilliance. And now, he's making videos of where his dad enacts various economic activities using his own allowance. Emily nodded awkwardly to the man's explanation. Ah, uh, I see. Video uploading. Uh, sorry, I'm not very familiar with that stuff. In one of the videos, Alex plays the role of a teacher, and his dad acts as a student who knows nothing. But the twist is, his dad is actually a current economics faculty lecturer, which has also become a talking point. As the man added this detail, Emily was taken aback once again. What? A current economics professor? Trying to hold back my laughter at her reaction, I stood tall. Him. No way, that's ridiculous. It must be a lie. You're just making this up for video views, aren't you? I know for a fact that he's just a dropout fool. As Emily pointed and ranted at me, the man gently lowered her finger and then turned to me for confirmation. A dropout. No, I heard he graduated from the university where he's now lecturing. I forgot which university it was. Your accusation must be some mistake, right? Filled with years of pent-up emotion, I stood tall with pride. That's right. Well known indeed. I graduated from H University's economics department and went on to their graduate school. Alex, standing next to me, looked proud as well. Hey. I plan to go to the same place someday. It's my dream to study at the same university as my dad. His bold declaration, unasked for, was incredibly endearing. That's ridiculous. It's all lies, all of it. I won't believe it. How embarrassing, lying like that at your age. So arrogant despite being poor. Emily trembled with rage, her face turning pale, while the man sighed. What are you talking about? You might not know, but Alex's channel is booming, with impressive numbers. He was in the top 10 of this year's channel subscriber rankings, wasn't he? He has sponsors, published books, and his account balances. Wait. The man paused, then glared at Emily. Hey, by any chance, have you been bothering these two all this time? Not just Emily, but the other women also averted their gazes uncomfortably. I'm terribly sorry for our behavior. This man must be the type who's competent at his job. He immediately faced us with an open posture and apologized to us. Although I thought it was a bit immature, I felt relieved to show Emily I was different from my past self, so I responded firmly. There's no need to apologize anymore, please don't. Look, people around us are watching. We have another appointment to attend to. So we'll be taking our leave now. Saying that, I quickly walked away with Alex. Of course, the man followed us, insisting on arranging a future appointment and wouldn't back down until he did. 
He's really dedicated to his job, even outside of working hours. A few days later, at 1 p.m., Nathan, the branch manager of the bank, and Kevin, the man from that day, came to our home with gifts in hand. Our home, though is not really ours since we're living in the house of a man named Thomas. When we first started living at Thomas's house, I was worried whether Alex would get attached to him or open his heart, but those worries were unfounded. They quickly developed a bond like that of a grandfather and grandson, and since it was comfortable for the three of us men to live together without any reservations, I offered to stay as a lodger, and Thomas happily agreed. Sure, go ahead, there are plenty of rooms, I'm single and elderly, so you never know when I might fall or collapse at home. It's reassuring to have someone around, so I'm all for it. So, Nathan, who came to our home with Kevin, turned out to be Emily's father. With a slightly balding head, he deeply apologized. Michael, I sincerely apologize as the person responsible for the extremely rude behavior of our employee the other day and for the inexcusable act of speaking about your background in public. Kevin next to him did the same. As I stood there stunned, Nathan, thinking his apology was insufficient, began to apologize even more deeply, and Kevin followed suit. I hurriedly passed them to the living room and made them sit on the sofa. Hey, what are you two doing? Please stop with the deep apologies. Then Nathan started speaking. Naturally, it was about the deposit. So, about your deposit. Ah, that's what this is about. As long as there's no major scandal involving the bank itself, I have no intention of doing anything. So please don't worry. Relieved by my words, both of them visibly relaxed. As for Emily, she's currently suspended from work and will be assigned to an internal department unrelated to customer information in the future. That's probably the right decision for the bank's future. After the matter was settled, we had a pleasant chat for a while, but then Nathan, perhaps as a way to take responsibility for this incident, or because I was Emily's classmate, started talking about being Emily's father. Emily was our long-awaited first daughter and the youngest child. It may not be appropriate to say this here, but she was so dear to us. We spoiled her much more than our three sons. We gave her everything she wanted, appeased her when she was upset, and more. Though she was academically excellent, and I believe not bad looking, her job hunting didn't go well. The recruiters must have seen through her personality. Every time she received a rejection notice, she would drink and become violent. It was painful to watch, so, unable to bear it, I arranged for her to join the bank, but that was not good for her. Job hunting was a good opportunity. It was a chance to think about why she was rejected. Yet, I lent a hand too early, just like always. With that, Nathan bit his lip. I should have helped my child to stand on her own, to think for herself, like Professor Thompson did for you. Hearing Nathan continue, I asked in surprise. Huh? Did you just mention Professor Thompson? Why would Nathan bring up Joseph here? Nathan smiled and shared an unexpected connection I didn't know about. Yes, a few years ago, I happened to meet Professor Thompson at the station, and he told me about you. Professor Thompson was my teacher during my student days. Joseph had supported me when I was devastated by the loss of my wife. That day, Joseph made a suggestion to me. Joseph, I don't want to go to work. There are plenty of others to replace me, and I want to quit. But if I do, my child and I won't be able to survive. We have no savings. To my worries, Joseph suggested a job. I know a retired university professor named Thomas. How about looking after him? His house is big, and you might be able to live there. He doesn't have any relatives nearby, and though I suggested he consider a nursing home, he refused. When I visited him last time, he sighed and mentioned how he wished he had someone to help around the house. Joseph added more information. He loves teaching since he was a professor, so he might help with studies when he's free. He's a bit hard of hearing, so he won't mind if Alex plays around, and it's a quiet environment, 
which could be good for a child's education. Feeling how much he cared, I ended up crying again. The Sunday of the week I talked with Joseph. Since Joseph was free that day, Alex and I, along with Joseph, went to visit Thomas's house. Thomas was around 80 years old, but didn't seem his age and was very energetic. He had lived a life dedicated to research and had never married. I was worried he might be difficult to get along with, but he was not shy and immediately took a liking to Alex, calling him a quick-thinking genius. Everything went smoothly, and Alex and I ended up living with Thomas. The next day, I contacted the factory and officially quit my job. The factory manager, Matthew, gave me a kind send-off, making me tear up a bit. I see. I was hoping that this rest period would give you some time to reflect positively, but you're still young, and there must be many things you want to do. Keep up the good work. I'm rooting for you. If you ever run into trouble or have something on your mind, don't hesitate to get in touch. Yes. Thank you so much for everything up to now. In a nurturing environment, I devoted myself to household chores, studying, and parenting. After passing the GED, I secretly applied to and was accepted into H University, which I had long admired. I attended school on a scholarship, joined a research lab, assisted the professor, and successfully completed my thesis. With Thomas's support, I never once stumbled during my university years. By the time I submitted my thesis, Thomas had taken an interest in Alex's genius and had started making videos for fun. When I told them I was advancing to graduate school and had been offered a part-time lecture position, Alex's eyes sparkled with excitement. Wow, you're going to be a lecturer. I'd love to attend one of your classes. It had been a while since I'd taught, so I practiced with Alex as my student, but he gave me a harsh evaluation. Dad, if you're going to teach like that, it's not going to work. Let me explain it more clearly. Just watch. When Alex offered to show me how it's done, I became the student in his class. We recorded the session, not for broadcasting, but as a keepsake. However, we didn't expect the first lesson to be so good. And when Thomas said it would be a waste not to share this, we decided to post it online, where it quickly surpassed a million views. Amused by the smooth flow and popularity of the video, Thomas decided to turn it into a series. Subsequently, Alex's videos were featured on variety shows and evening news programs. This led to the publication of a book that explains economics in a way children can understand, and Alex became a sought-after talent, dubbed a child investor. It's hard to believe that we once lived a modest life while I worked at the factory. I truly feel that we've been blessed and supported by so many people. When I shared our story with Nathan and the others, Nathan began to speak quietly. Actually, I knew about the environment you were living in when you were in the neighborhood. I knew the situation you were placed in. I tensed up at his words. It's shameful as an adult, and there's nothing that can be done about it, but outsiders can't interfere in family matters. I had thought if you ever sought help and no one else was there, I would step in, but you had already left. Your will to survive was stronger than my desire to help. Still, it's rare for a child thrown into society to come out unscathed. I regret that I didn't tack sooner instead of waiting. I was speechless at his unexpected words. Back then, without telling my daughter the details, I asked her to be mindful of you, but she must not have liked that. Maybe she wondered why her parents cared about someone else instead of her. I think it was around her high school years when I heard from others about what she had done to you and immediately scolded her. She apologized meekly at the time, but the fact that she hasn't changed over the years might be a problem with her character. I didn't know what to say to Nathan, who looked dejected. The room was enveloped in a gloomy atmosphere. Feeling awkward, I decided to change the subject by asking something I was curious about. By the way, how are my parents doing? Your parents moved away shortly after you left that house. The house was demolished, and now the site is vacant, he informed me. They probably feared that I, having fled, might expose them. 
for whatever reason. They haven't contacted Alex or me, even though we're now visible in public. I don't have a good opinion of my parents and have no intention of seeking them out. I'll think about it if the time comes. Though they didn't raise me properly, I'm grateful they brought me into this world, so I won't reject them outright. Nathan glanced at his watch and said, Well, it's about time we left. I'm truly sorry for this occasion. And they left. After seeing them off, I went for a walk outside, reflecting on my past and present relationships and my own life. I was a dirty, impoverished child with neither money nor wisdom. Honestly, what Emily said wasn't wrong. I was unloved by my parents, disliked by classmates, and shunned by adults, living a life of solitude. Even though I was crawling at the bottom of society, I learned that there were people willing to reach out to me. Looking back, perhaps I was too consumed by the hatred for my parents, classmates, teachers, and the adults around me that I didn't even consider seeking help. I might have been too cornered then, but if I had been unable to trust anyone and just hardened up, I might have ended up missing, just like my parents. Though my time with my late wife was short, her kindness and sincerity touched me, and having a son like Alex, who trusts me completely, allowed me to regain my humanity. Come to think of it, I've spent more time with Alex than with my wife. Meeting wonderful people like Joseph and Thomas, who gave love without expecting anything in return, was a priceless lucky card in my life. What I thought was a life of despair turned out to be filled with irreplaceable treasures. Looking up at the sky, I saw a rainbow, perhaps because it had just stopped raining. I remembered my wife, whose memory was slightly fading over time, and expressed my gratitude. Thank you. Now, it's time to head back home. As I approached the house, I could hear Alex and Thomas's laughter from inside, enjoying a game together. Listening to their laughter, I slowly closed the door behind me, 